So we're going to go over one case, and of course, we're going to show uh, TraumaCAD virtual planning again. Uh, and we're just looking at uh, pre-op planning for tibia <coughs> using an internal lengthening nail. We're going to show a case that, like Rob just shows, has varus. So it, you'll, you'll take the lengthening concepts with some of the coronal realignment concepts. So this guy is a, a mixed martial arts fighter. He uh, wants his limbs equalized. And the question you should be asking yourself is, um, you know, you better not screw this up, but because um, he can hurt you, I guess. But he, how do you make sure there's not associated deformities in addition to the limb length discrepancy, right? So every patient we see, you, you must analyze all components of the deformity, even if they're coming to see you for what may be just a limb length discrepancy. So this guy has um, varus in addition to his limb length discrepancy. You want to make sure you do good surgery. So um, we went over a little bit the routine radiologic analysis of a patients with an LLD, and then uh, we're going to go over deformity analysis and a coronal realignment in a patient who has an LLD, and we'll talk about some indications for blocking screws. So again, chapters one, two, three, and four in this textbook is critical. Don't forget chapter four. So we went over this a this morning, but routine radiographic evaluation. So these patients should get a standing hip to ankle. Their limbs should be equalized. It should be calibrated. The knee should be forward. You should not accept anything but that. Okay. And then that I think should be pushed into your packs for um, your virtual planning. So I'm just going to tell you this guy has an LLD. And he has a varus limb. That's a Tetsworth malalignment test. It's coming from his tibia. His tibia is short, and his tibia is in varus. So this is um, this is going to be the analog planning using my software. So the first thing I do, Rob mentioned the the indirect measurement or the total limb length discrepancy. So he's wearing a 30 millimeter block under his right foot. Now I'm going to measure from the top of his iliac crest to the cassette. So this measurement will give you an assessment of his pelvis and his foot. So Rob showed a patient who had a fibular hemimyelia. So this patient obviously had a lot of foot and ankle loss of length. So you would probably use this measurement if you're doing a limb equalization. So you want to take into account his foot. Or if a patient has a significant pes planus, uh, you may want to consider that. Okay, so then you're going to have to do the math because... There's a discrepancy, and he's wearing a block. So here's my um, line through the femur. The femur is normal. This is where I want his foot, his, his MAD to be at the end. So that's where his foot has got to be. So I'm just drawing a line up and a line down. That generates the intersection point. That'll, that'll uh, tell us where the apex is. And then you can get the magnitude, so 180 degrees minus 171.21. Okay, so then I'm just creating, uh, I'm telling myself the osteotomy is going to be here. Then you should think about metaphyseal location of the osteotomy or an osteotomy that's not at the isthmus of the bone. If you're using an IM nail like we do for trauma, that is a potential area for the bone to be malaligned. So now I'm just assessing the trajectory and entry point, just like Dr. Rosbrook mentioned. So I'm going to put a joint orientation line. I want to get a sense, where is that guide wire going to go down in the proximal femur? So I'm just going to overlap this line with the line coming from the femoral head with a joint orientation line to tell me where should I put the guide wire and what trajectory should that guide wire be in the proximal segment. It really should be about A9. Then I'm going to get rid of these extra lines. <clears throat> okay, so this should be a little moved over, but basically mathematically I need to come in at this entry point with that trajectory 
to get me a realignment of this patient's limb, which you saw a little before. This is just doing it again, a different way to get the magnitude of the correction, taking an angle between those two lines. So I'm going back to marking out the osteotomy site and I'm thinking about blocking screws. So this is metaphyseal location. So the nail will never fill the canal at this location. So you need to protect that and make sure your trajectory is contained in this segment. So we're going to put blocking screws on the concavity of the deformity or with the reverse rule of thumb technique, which all my residents use. So all my residents use this technique. You can look at the trauma literature, you can think about it and try to reason it out, or you can try to use this. So this is basically what you're going to do. You're making this straight, so your thumbs are going to be pushing on this side of the bone. So your blocking screws go on the opposite side of your thumbs. Sexy! After lunch! Nice! Thank you. After lunch, I know. After lunch. So, indications for blocking screws in limb lengthening surgery. So, correct coronal or sagittal alignment. Maintaining alignment during lengthening, especially with internal lengthening nails. Or increasing stability. Okay, so I've used it for increasing stability, which is also quite effective. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going back into the deformity module. Going to calibrate the image. So this you saw, so I'm going to move this along. So that's our deformity analysis. Okay, so here's, here's the planning using the virtual, virtual planning. So it already contains all the numbers. So you see I'm just clicking it on and off to show you. So we'll take it away. So many numbers on the screen. I'm going to drop down an 89 in this case because the patient has an LDFA of 89. So if the LDFA is 89, the MPTA is 89, it should give us a straight leg. I'm just dropping a line down and a line up. This is going to give us, again, the cora or the apex of the osteotomy as well as the magnitude. I mean, you get really OCD with it, with your, with your lines. You have that type of personality. We're going to move the osteotomy. Obviously, you don't want it too high, or you can't control the proximal segment. You can't do it too low, or you're going to miss an opportunity for deformity correction. Right? As this line starts impinging on that cortex, you're going to lose out on angular correction. So I'm, I'm, being, I'm getting a sense of how am I going to execute that. So my osteotomy should be about 80 millimeters from the joint line. All of this is not really necessary because you already did the planning analog, but this is just a way to prove it to you. Then you can do your lengthening, and then you can go back and check your MAD to see that your leg is realigned. So all the, all the companies have their stuff in the system. So we're going to go to Nuvasive in this case. We're going to select a nail. We're going to select the tibial nail. 
We're going to overlay the nail. This is all calibrated so it's reasonably accurate. You can check your length and you can find your surgery like that. You can save your workflow at each point, but each point you can save to see the different steps. So I'm just going to do a final test with the green line. This is the malalignment test again. So that tells me if I do this in the OR with those blocking screws, with that osteotomy, with that nail, then I should get a realignment like so. So in the OR, first step for me is marking the osteotomy uh, a certain distance from the joint line. Uh, I vent it with a 4A drill bit. I cut the fibula. I get ready for the entry point and trajectory. Again, this is where a little bit uh, inaccuracy comes in, I'm trying to get that 89 degree trajectory. I put a posterior blocking screw first. And this is an AP blocking screw as planned. And then I'm measuring the alignment after the nail goes in. And the, the alignment's obtained and maintained with the IM nail. I didn't put a blocking screw distally because I thought I had enough ismic fit here that I didn't think this thing would really move. So that's him at the end. So my, my point with this is, you know, the surgeries are never hard in general. Surgery is not hard. Surgery is only hard if you want to do it properly. So this surgery is not difficult. Just like Dr. Rosbrook's case where he showed the tibial realignment with the blocking screw. It's very easy to put the tibial nail in but if you actually wanted to realign it, even if you wanted to realign it four degrees, it's just harder to do right. So surgery in general is not hard. You've seen people do surgery. It's not hard. If you want to do it properly, it's difficult, okay? So be comprehensive, be detail-oriented, execute a good preoperative plan. Blocking screws are best at non-ismic osteotomies and those that require coronal or sagittal realignment. Thank you very much.